All right, guys, we are now up to topic 4.5, the market revolution, colon, industrialization. Now, this is going to be uh, kind of unusual in that we're going to have the same title for two different topics, the market revolution. And this one, we're going to focus more on technology. And then in topic 4.6, we're going to focus more on like societal effects of this market revolution. So let's get into some technology, some, uh, some inventions, and uh, let's see what effect it has on America. So uh, our guiding question, question is what economic changes occurred in America during the market revolution? Let's begin first by looking at entrepreneurs. Now, as you know, entrepreneurs are people who take on financial risks to open businesses. Uh, they might succeed, they might fail, but what happens is these entrepreneurs are helping to create this new way of doing business in America, a way of doing business that looks far more modern to us than something that happened, say, during the colonial period. So we're going to see um, all kinds of new developments. We're going to see uh, what we call market relationships between producers and consumers. That simply means uh, producers are constantly trying to gauge what customers want, how much they'll pay. Consumers have a plethora of choices among products to choose from. And with every purchase, they're basically voting for one producer over the other. We're also going to see a far more organized manufacture of goods um, as corporations come online. So gone will be the days of kind of like, um, you know, the, the one guy who's making stuff uh, in his home and then selling it at the local store. Uh, now we're going to focus more on mass production and mass consumption. All right, well, let's get into some of those innovations and inventions. So if you look at our map of, um, of industry, you're going to notice manufacturing is heavily concentrated in the Northeast. And the reason for that is that is where the American Industrial Revolution began. Um, we can sort of pinpoint this to a particular person. His name is Samuel Slater. He was a British engineer uh, who came over to America with plans for industrial machines, uh, textile machines, memorized. And uh, the British didn't like the idea of this technology getting out, and they called him famously Slater the Trader. He's going to get some financial backing from a guy from Rhode Island named Moses Brown, and in 1791, the very first cotton spinning machines are up and running in Rhode Island. Pawtucket, Rhode Island is the place. That's the original factory. So really, I mean, if you want to think about this uh, this way, I mean, pretty much all American factories really trace their origins back to this in Rhode Island. These early textile mills are run by water power, right? You have a water wheel that transfers power via belts into the machines of the factory. Um, so you, I mean, it's great. It's going to give you pretty much unlimited power, but you have to build your uh, factories near rivers. That's the one downside. All right, other inventions. Eli Whitney, of course, we all know him for the cotton gin. We're going to talk about the effect. We will talk about the effects of the cotton gin uh, later. Uh, Wide-ranging effects. This is going to be some 50 times more efficient at its job of removing seeds from raw cotton. So it's going to vastly increase the production of textiles, not just in America, but across the world. Eli Whitney, he also comes up with this idea of interchangeable parts. So I want you to imagine if you went to a car dealership today, you know, these brand new cars, they're sitting there in the lot, and if they were to allow you to do this, not that they would, but if they were to allow you, let's say they had two identical cars, let's say they're both um, Ford F-150s, right, two trucks that are identical, you could literally take the door off of one and put it on the other, right, because they're interchangeable. And this idea of, of making standardized parts that are interchangeable, while it sounds common sense to us now, was revolutionary at the time. This allows for the more rapid manufacturing, but also repair of items. And this gets started with muskets, which, as you can imagine, in the field, you need to be able to repair muskets quickly, otherwise soldiers can die. This is a, a huge turn of events for manufacturing. All right, our next innovation is going to come from a guy named Cyrus McCormick. In 1834, he comes up with the Mechanical Reaper. And what this is going to do is greatly in increase the speed of harvesting, allowing one person to do the job of many and getting that harvest in more quickly. Um, specialization, guys, this is going to be the key. 
uh, when it comes to industry. Along those same lines, in 1637, another farming invention, the steel plow. So previous plows had been made out of either wood or iron. This one is made out of steel, meaning it is very tough, and the thick soils of the Midwest can be broken up. And this is going to really allow just thousands and thousands and thousands of acres of farmland to be developed when John Deere develops this plow in 1637. Now, with all these fancy new technologies, however, there is a bit of a problem. Uh, farmers tend to go in debt for uh, to, to purchase these devices, uh, meaning they're always going to be kind of looking over their shoulder and hoping they can pay down their debt to a bank for fear of being foreclosed on. It also changes kind of how we fa get how we farm. So in the days past, your independent farmer had grown food for his own survival. Now we're moving on to what we call market agriculture, where you specialize in a crop or two and you focus just on that. You sell the crop then for a profit and you use that profit to purchase the goods that you need. So it's less independence and more just as a business. 1844, uh, the world gets a whole lot smaller with Samuel Morse inventing the telegraph. Uh, telegraph, the word literally means distance writing, and that's what this is. We're, we're going to be able to send a message over long distances using the power of electricity, and now uh, instead of having to wait days or weeks for a return letter, you can get a message back in literally just minutes. And eventually, we're going to uh, lay a cable all the way across the Atlantic, allowing transatlantic telegraphs. Uh, so what had taken weeks to get across, get across the Atlantic now will just take minutes uh, to get that message. Oh, by the way, I'm going to go back to the picture here. Samuel Morse, again, famous for the telegraph. He's also, believe it or not, famous for being an artist. In fact, this is a painting done by Samuel Morse. He painted this while he was living in Paris, and he would visit the Louvre, this famous museum, which includes the Mona Lisa, and he decided to kind of like a make, a, make a painting of paintings, which I think is pretty cool. All right, 1846, Elias Howe uh, and uh, later Isaac Singer uh, develop the modern sewing machine. Now, I know that doesn't sound very exciting, but trust me, this is a huge deal because before this time, people would purchase cloth and make their own clothing at home. Now, this is going to allow what we call the ready-made clothing industry. So now you would go to the store and you would purchase ready-made clothing. And later during the Civil War, standardized sizes will come online. Now, if you look at our, our workers here, notice they're sewing machines, but also notice what they're making. Uh, these were the famous crinoline dresses, these big hoop dresses that were so popular in the mid-1800s, both here in America and over in Europe. And uh, this is kind of the, the structure of one of them. And here's kind of a, a satirical look at just how big these dresses got. All right, now let's look at transportation. So this is a really interesting map. It's showing us how far can you go within a day in 1800 from New York City. So New York City, if you traveled for a day in 1800, you would reach if you were lucky, eastern Pennsylvania, right? That's about as far as you could possibly go. But by 1830, that same day's travel will get you all the way down to Maryland and Delaware, um, all the way to uh, western Massachusetts. What had taken six weeks or more now only takes three weeks or so. So we are rapidly increasing transportation. Let's try to figure out why that is. One of the reasons was new roads. So in 1811, what's called the National Road or the Cumberland Road gets started. This is going to go from Cumberland, Maryland westward. Ultimately, it will get all the way to Vandalia, Illinois, some 591 miles. It's going to take them a couple decades to finish this road, but it is, it's, it's kind of the precursor of the interstate highway system, right? This idea of connecting cities and towns together uh, via a well-built road. 1807, Robert Fulton decides to take a James Watt type steam engine, put it on a boat, a boat that has a paddle wheel, and take this boat up and down the Hudson River from New York City to the state capital of Albany. Why is this a big deal? Well, what happens is the steamboat turns rivers into two-way highways. Because before the steamboat, you could 
you know, go downstream with the current, but going upstream was nearly impossible. Now you can go both ways. And by 1860, the year right before the uh, American Civil War, there's about a thousand steamboats on the Mississippi alone. So this is a technology that's going to really transform how we transport people and goods. All right, if you recall, the American system had... Uh, preached this message of building lots and lots of canals, and a good example of this would be the Erie Canal. Now, the Erie Canal um, was financed by the state of New York. Um, the governor, DeWitt Clinton, this was kind of his claim to fame. In fact, some people called it uh, Clinton's Ditch to refer to this uh, this long canal connecting Lake Erie to the Hudson River, uh, thus allowing travel from any of the Great Lakes to the Hudson River and then out to the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, some 363 miles of digging to be done. And uh, there you go. There's a picture of the Erie Canal in action. Now, what are some effects of the Erie Canal? Well, um, number one, farming across the Midwest becomes more profitable because it's not just the Erie Canal. It's other canals that are going to be built as well. So let's say you have a farm over here in central Indiana. You could export your products down this canal the Wabash and Erie Canal, then you can go across Lake Erie, up here to Buffalo, get on the uh, the, uh, the Erie Canal, over to the Hudson River, down the Hudson River, to the Port of New York, and then out to anywhere you want to go in the world. This allows immigrants also to travel into the Midwest and settle this area, so they're going to travel this way, and then set up farms out here, and cities that had been nothing more than little villages or towns are going to grow tremendously because of these canals. There's a, a better view of all these canals. Again, the Erie Canal is probably the most famous, but there are plenty others as well. All right, railroads um, are starting to come online in the 1820s and 1830s. Uh, the first really major railroad in America was the Baltimore and Ohio, or B&O, Railway. Now, the railroads have some really big advantages over the canal. Number one, speed. Canal boats go just a couple of miles per hour, whereas trains can go dozens of miles per hour. They're far cheaper to build. You're just putting down rails. You're not digging this giant ditch. Also, they're not going to freeze over in the wintertime like a canal could, particularly like the Erie Canal. And they can cross mountains by doing tunneling or finding valleys, but canals, of course, can't do that. Canals have to go on flat land. Otherwise, um, you'll develop a current, and then the canal itself just simply won't work. So you can see uh, some of the railroads uh, built by 1850 in the black lines, by uh, between 1850 and 1860, just kind of an explosion of railways all across North America. And so you can see areas receiving New York newspapers. Um, within 10 days, you can get a newspaper from New York City anywhere out here. Now, that may not seem like a big deal, guys, but trust me, that really is. The idea that news can travel now within days, not weeks or months, that's a huge leap forward. So what's the effects, then, of this better transportation? So we're going to see uh, just greater trade, extended markets, which means you can get, uh, you know, customers can get goods from further away. You're going to be able to tap into new customer bases and new production. Uh, this is going to foster what we call regional interdependence. So certain areas can specialize in certain crops, and then other areas can specialize in other crops, and they become interdependent by trading back and forth. Uh, for example, if you look closely in where we are at here in uh, Clarksville, you'll notice tobacco was a major source of uh, production. This is what we specialized in around here. In fact, our newspaper, the Leaf Chronicle, gets its name from the fact that, it, uh, you know, from tobacco leaves. That was the, re that's the reason it's called the Leaf Chronicle, from tobacco leaves. All right, other effects. So we're going to see um, certain regions become closely tied to others. These transportation links, if you look closely, they're connecting the north with the Midwest very closely via railways and canalways and even roadways. But the South is kind of left out. The South is not as connected to those two territories. So we're going more east-west up here, and here we're going kind of more north-south to try to get to tap in to those regions. So if you look at these regional ties, um, you really 
um, the, the, the massive economic explosion that is the mid 1800s can't happen without a, uh, without those commercial ties. So in the South, they're, they're increasing their co cotton production tremendously. That cotton can be shipped, uh, to the North where it can be turned into textiles. Those textiles can be sold in America, but also overseas. The South is also shipping cotton to Britain, to their factories. Um, so you just have this, these regional interdependent ties. Um, kind of really tying the whole country together as one big economic system. That's what we call the market revolution. All right, I know that was a lot of information, a lot of technologies and stuff to throw at you guys. Um, that is uh, our market revolution. Now, in our next video, we're also going to look at the market revolution, but through more of kind of uh, societal effects, what's happening to Americans as this new way of doing business uh, takes hold.